Hey, a little bit of the purge. I'm bringing you guys another Q&A session. I know it's been a while since I did my last one, but uh, somebody gave me a tweet on the internet and I remembered. And I'm going to do that now. Um, I talked to Luminous briefly about this as well. He said that it would be good if I actually wrote the questions on the screen. I don't know if you guys can read these or not. Um, let me see if I can uh, expand this any larger. 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 Okay. My webcam is slightly in the way now, but I think that will be okay. I wish I could move this to the left. I'm just using a Google Docs thing, so let me just... Uh, Adjust my webcam a little bit if I can find the frickin' corner of this thing. Alright. Give me a corner. This shouldn't be this hard. Maybe I'll just... Oh, that's why it was weird. Okay, I found the corners. Alright, beautiful. I think you can see now, right? Right? Okay, cool. Webcam in the upper right. Alright, questions one by one so you guys can see what is going on. This way, if you don't like the question I'm answering, you can jump ahead. Uh, just a quick understanding once again of what's going on. Um, I'm just going to do these periodically. I have a thread on my website on the forums, uh, purgegamers.com slash forum. Go check that out there, guys, if you want to um, leave questions for the future Q&As. Um, I put the link in the drop-down box below, so you can find it very, very easily, and go post there if you're interested. Also, if you guys are looking for people to play with, if you don't have a lot of Dota plain friends, then you can go there and try to make friends. Um, I know that there's a couple of my fans that have already done this very successfully, so go give it a shot sometime if you guys are looking for people to play with, or you, just, you want to talk to uh, people about Dota and stuff like that. It's good for that. And I do post there sometimes, so. Alright, into this. Um, just to also give you one more overview. Um, this is going to be a mix of personal as well as Dota-related questions. So if you guys don't like the personal questions, then you can skip ahead. If you don't like the Dota-related questions, then you can skip ahead. But it's mostly Dota questions. At least the crop that I grabbed this time. Okay. First question. I have a very hard, hard time understanding the chaos that is a team fight. Any advice on how to understand more about what's going on so I can react with my character more appropriately. Most of this is just playing a lot. You have to kind of play enough team fights where you can uh, then adjust to them um, just by personal experience basically. You just have to play enough games and only until that point are you going to start team fighting effectively. Um, you can do stuff like, you can look at replays. Um, when I did the replay casting the other day on live stream, um, I did a, um, it, it was easier to figure out exactly what went wrong. So what usually happens is you have a team fight and you're like, I have no idea how we lost that. Well, you can watch them after the fact. You can look at hero positioning. You can see if somebody died without getting their spells off. And generally you just learn that stuff instinctively. So it's very difficult for me to just give you a solution like say, how to know what's going on. So I guess I'd recommend watching replays. If there's a team fight that really confused the shit out of you, then watch the replay. I still get flustered in some team fights, but generally when you play enough games, usually you have all your hotkeys down, you know how to execute properly, you just use your spells effectively. And that's just something that comes with time. And I would say, at this point, I can always tell when I could, would almost always tell when I could just tell, oh, we didn't execute that well enough, or maybe the position of the fight was kind of weird, and it was more advantageous for them, Some, something like that. Those are a little bit um, easier to um, recognize when you play enough. So, Next question uh, from the same guy, I believe. When I'm in the mid lane solo, I feel rushed to buy items quickly because of receiving gold much faster than a side lane and not having to shop to buy stuff at on a whim. Any advice on how to practice buying items quickly, getting them on the courier for delivery without stealing the courier while balancing that out with more or less hits, denies, and harassment? If you guys are playing a solo mid role, generally you get uh, courier preference at the start of the game, at the least, assuming you're a bottle hero when you first get your bottle. And if you have the correct item build, which should mean you should be getting a relatively fast bottle, don't spend all your money essentially, you should be getting the bottle between two to three minutes. So the first courier swing should always be you. Make sure that your allies, I hate when my allies do this, but they'll do something like, oh, I'm playing a side lane support here, I need to finish my wand at one minute. Because we got first bloods. No. No, you're not going to complete your wand. You're going to wait till I get my bottle and then you can complete your wand. Especially when the courier is not upgraded. If you really want to grab a fast item as a side lane support, Make sure you upgrade the courier first so that you don't waste as much time for the courier to walk all the way there and all the way back and give it a high chance of dying. So, um, in terms of the actual question you asked, make sure you get a bottle relatively fast. You should get that bottle relatively fast without your allies jacking the courier. So if they jack it, it's their fault, essentially. Make sure that you know what item you're going to be getting. If you know you're getting a bottle, you wait till you have 600 gold, you open the shop, you right-click the bottle, and then you send the courier to you. And make sure you set up courier hotkeys. Whenever I grab a courier, I have the courier hotkey to F3, so I press F3, and then I press Y to transfer items from stash to courier, then I press T to, to tell the courier to bring the items to me, and I press R for speed burst when it's a flying courier. That's what I do. Make sure you keep an eye on the map if it's a regular courier if you're playing a solo mid so it doesn't get sniped because it's one right click and super easy to kill. Uh, very important. So just bring the items to you. Done. Easy stuff. Uh, 
it's simply, it doesn't take me that long. Sometimes I'll miss a last hit or two, but it's never more than that. If you know what you're buying, which should almost always be a bottle or boots or a wand completion or a TP scroll, those are like really the only items you need as a mid hero for most heroes. That is just F3 YTR and then go back to last city. Well, you have to open shop, right click the bottle, F3 YTR. But that it shouldn't take you more than five to 10 seconds. You can practice doing this, go into a bot game or something get some gold, buy an item, and then F3, Y2, or whatever your hotkeys are. Set them up to whatever you want. That's my recommendation. Buying fast is definitely important, but it's easier in Dota 2 now than it is in Dota 1, so you guys should be happy. What is a good method to practice my carry play outside of pre-made in-house games and pre-made pubs? I always tend to wait and pick what my team needs me to pick, which usually ends up being hard support. I'm comfortable and very confident in that role, but it gets old after the while. I feel you, man. I practice my last sitting a lot in self-made private games, but I want to practice my, or put my farming abilities to practice in real game by playing carry more often. Thank you and keep the good work. Um, one way that you can do this that I usually do is I just random a lot, so some days I'll get a hard carry, but make sure you random immediately at the start of the game, and preferably before anybody else has picked a hard carry or a lot of other heroes, because you should always try to pick to fill in your team's gaps. Uh, the most important thing I can say here is, but you, you brought up as well, pre-made pubs is the way to go. If you really want to play, I do this a lot when I'm trying to make gameplay commentaries, I play with friends because when you play with pubs, they don't give a shit about what they pick usually. You'll say, like when I was trying to make the Visage gameplay for Dota Cinema in the last couple days, I had to play about four or five Visage games before I finally got a Visage in the correct lane setup where the game ended up going okay. So it's just like, you have to preferably play with your friends and say, I want to pick Void, can you support me with a Crystal Maiden? They'll say, okay, and bam, you have a good lane, done. That's by far the best way to do it. Um, if you're in a pub, you could random and say, okay, I have a hard carry, hope, pray to God that your allies fill things in. At the very least, if you picked first, you should be able to pick what lane you want, you can just type that out, or if you random and get a solo here, you say solo mid, done deal. Don't try to like force other people out of roles that are not ideal for their hero's matchup as well. Don't say, oh, Lifestealer? You're trying to lane, no, 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 I picked a carry as well, so I should lane, you should jungle, because you could jungle. But it's like, dude, Lifestealer jungle isn't that good. So don't don't take people over, just try to pick fast. If you really want to play a specific hero, pick him early, or play with your friends. That's that's my recommendation for that. Had a five game loss streak, how do you deal with it and get out of a slump? Kind of taunting my, or tainting my playability ace at second. I had lost streaks recently as well. It happens to everybody, man. It sucks. Like, getting stomp sucks, losing multiple games sucks. Winning is what everybody wants, but unfortunately, of course, it's most fair if you play somebody that is about the same skill level as you. There's a lot of factors that come down to it. The Probably the best way to be okay with it is just look at what went wrong, why you lost the game, and just move on from there. Just make sure that you're learning from every game, because every game that you lose is a good explanation of why did you lose a lane. Was it a lane setup? Was it uh, bad team fighting? Was it just lack of teamwork? You'll learn all of that stuff, and it'll help you learn better in the future and how to help win more games. So it sucks. The best way to do just walk away from the computer or don't play Dota for like half a day. I do that regularly. I just say, yeah, I just spent six hours casting. I'm just not going to play Dota tonight. I'll go do other stuff. We'll play StarCraft Customs or something like that. And I just walk away, and I come back and play later. Like, the game is still there, and you still love it, and it sucks to play those games, but they do help you learn. So that's my recommendation. What are my thoughts on pro games influencing the way people play pubs nowadays? I, uh, for example, strategy is counter warding and smoke ganking. I think it's all good. Um, I've not well, it's it's hard to say this. I've personally noticed the skill level has drastically increased from Dota two to Dota one. Probably for the fact that I was on average a better player than the people that I would match against or play with in Dota 1 pubs. Just a, a little bit of background on that. In Dota 1, there would be a game hosted, and you'd say, oh, I want to play RD. So you'd join Dota Cash, RD, US plus CA, whatever, L you know, LC, whatever. You'd join a game, and then other people would join the game. And then the game would start, and it was basically just random people. And people would look at skill graphs and stuff and see what your win-loss was or what your ELO was, but it was pretty much like a pub game with randoms. It would be as if you said... Q for matchmaking with no skill descriptors. You would get random people over the board. So right now when I play pubs, I generally have a good time because there's always wording, there's always smoke ganking, there's all that good stuff. Um, that's very enjoyable to do. Uh, and I think that all people are of course learning from pro games or videos like mine and stuff like that. Like sometimes I'll play against like an SK Lena lane and I'll be like, God, I shouldn't have talked about how good that lane was, you know? Because I've just, it's like everybody wants to play shitty players because then they can win every game. On average, this is the general mentality when you're playing Dota casually, but 
you know, unfortunately it can't be like that, and it shouldn't be like that, because you should be matched up against people just as good as you, so it's a good thing. People are warding much more than they used to. Like, I used to play Dota 1 pubs, nobody ever warded. You'd be lucky to get one set of wards in the entire the entire game. So, it's getting better. And I know that you guys probably have different experiences because you're at different skill levels, so maybe the skill level you're at is really low or at a medium place and people don't ward and they're really inconsistent. But as a whole, I think things are getting better. At the very least, the fact that you can be matched up against a team that is as talented or as bad as you is great. Um, it's going to help everybody get better a lot faster. That's the main thing. Everybody's going to get much better this way. Alright, I... Can you see this? right there. Alright. I notice when you have a lane to yourself and no enemy around you, you still deny creeps if the enemy's not around to get that 50% less XP. By the way, it's not... I don't believe it's 50%. Depends on whether you're a ranged or a melee hero. That's important. Uh, what should be the point of denying creeps? Thanks in advance. I'm a big fan. I wanted you to let you know how much your vids help my game. I'm happy to hear that. Thanks. Um, a couple reasons. First of all, lane control. You want to make sure that the lanes, especially if you're playing a hard carry and you don't want the lane to move, you want to make sure that the, there's equal amounts of creeps on yours creeps and their creeps. You want to have one range creep and three melee, and they want to have three melee and one range. That's because you know that their damage is exactly equivalent, and that their lanes will not push against yours, and yours will not push against them. So you can stay in that really safe boundary right next to your tower. That's the important part. So, if I notice that my wave has too many creeps, I'll start denying my creeps af once they get below 50%, because I know that I'll try to equalize things, and if I can, then the waves will not move. If I want to push, Whatever, I go for last hits. If the lane is pushing, you want to deny creeps, because keep in mind that, let's say I'm by my tier 2 tower on the dire side, and there's a creep, that the lane is pushing, like it's got two range creeps, it's out of my control, I can't deny it. Let's say one of the creeps is at one last hit. I'll just deny that, because I know eventually that creep is going to make it all the way to the enemy team, or it has a chance of making it to the enemy team. And then when the enemy team shows up with their morphling, they'll say, oh, there's like eight creeps here, they'll waveform, kill everything, ban. That's a lot of farm. So if there's a creep to deny you probably should do it, unless you're pushing a tower. Especially when you're playing Lich with Sacrifice. Try not to deny a full HP creep, full HP creeps if you actually have mana, because you want to be able to push. So that's pretty much it. It's lane control. There's also a chance that somebody could be within EXP range that I don't know about. That's also important. That's something I started doing when I was a noob. It's more just a bad habit more than anything. But generally, it's just lane control and good habits to get into. So you might as well. It Just make sure that you don't miss a last hit by denying. That's very important. Hello Purge, I've been struggling at around 49.5%, I assume this is win ratio for a month plus, and I can't seem to get 50% or higher. I've went on 5-10 to 10 game winning streaks, and then I get about 7 wins away from 50-50 and end up going on a losing streak. Can you give me ideas what I should do? This is, this is totally normal, man. There's nothing wrong with this. You do not have to be above a 50% win ratio to say that you're a good player. And even still, you shouldn't be that... You shouldn't really be that concerned about how good you are at the game. Everybody likes to be good. I like to be good. Sometimes I get sad when I play shitty. But it's not something you should be aiming for. Your win ratio, all it reflects is, if it's close to 50, it's perfect. It should be close to 50. Especially if you're not at either extreme of the skill chart. If you're anywhere between probably 25% and 85% of the skill ratio, you should be close to 50. You want to play people that are just as good as you because there's less likely, there's less chance that you'll get stomped majorly, and there's uh, more likely that it'll be a close game. Stomps are not fun to play, the game end fast, whatever, people will get the late game. You want games to be really equal, that's when things are the most fun. So really, don't be too afraid about being close to 50%. And the reason that you go on winning streaks, and then you get really close to 50-50, and then you get stomped on a losing streak, that's because the system says, oh, look at him, he just won like f six games in a row, he's obviously improved a lot or something like that, his flexibility has changed, or maybe he just got really good all of a sudden, and they'll rank you up a little bit. And as you get ranked up, all of a sudden, the next consequent times that you play in matchmaking, you start playing against better and better people, and then as you play against better and better people, you're more likely to lose games, and then you lose games, you go on a losing streak, it moves your ELO back down, and you kind of do this little thing, you do this like up and down thing, so look at it this way, when you lose a game by a team who is obviously better than you, you're just going to rank down, and then you're going to play people that are worse than that, and you're more likely to win, so just, you got to take the losses, say whatever, we just got stumped, they were better than us, we can play better next time, look at your faults, and just move on. It's that simple. And don't be afraid about your win ratio, it's not a big deal. If you're close to 50%, that's great. I know there are lots of people that are below 50%, a lot of new players, stuff like that, who had no idea what they're doing, and it's very frustrating. But try to aim for 50%, that's where you should be. Well, alright, personal question, first one. What was your job before you became a professional caster? Um... 
I got a physics degree with an emphasis in electronics, which was very, very minor emphasis in electronics. It was pretty much just a physics degree with an internship that involved electronics. Um, the job that I had full time when I thought of my YouTube channel was I was a kind of a low level programmer, tech uh, assembly, troubleshooting software job. So I did like programming, hardware assembly, troubleshooting, test of methods, just stuff like that. Um, it was uh, 40, about 40 hours a week with about an hour of driving every day. So it was like 45 to 50, somewhere in there, hours of wasted time, <laughs> pretty much, where I'd be like, I don't want to do this. I want to do something else. So that was my job before I became caster. And I got laid off last summer. So this was 2000, summer of 2011. That's when I really started full-timing Dota. And I still didn't make money for like six months, I think. I had about six months of essential unemployment where I made zero money, uh, other than unemployment, that is. But um, that was my job before I became caster. And uh, I'm very happy they moved on. Um, I was a little hesitant about adding this question because I am not going to answer it. I'm just going to kind of talk about it, but um, no threat or um, that's not the right way I meant to say it. Um, I meant like no, no offense intended by not answering it, but I just wanted to teach you or tell, talk about this for a second just so you guys get some reference point. That's all. You seem to be avoiding this question in general, but I think it's something all of us that are loyal followers would actually really like to know. Are you in a relationship and with who? Um, I don't want to answer the question because generally this is something that I think is largely should be separated from being a personality. Um, if you're like a celebrity power couple, like a huge actor or something, sometimes it happens and there's nothing you can do about it. But I think as a whole, this is just private information that I don't really feel like sharing. To be honest, when whenever I was in a relationship on Facebook, I was always hesitant to even list that shit because... I mean, if somebody is really your friend, like, let's say, we'll talk about the Facebook example for a bit. If somebody is actually your friend, they're going to know that you're in a relationship with somebody. It's not like it's something that you need to parade around. Um, in a lot of ways, a relationship is just something that you should probably, you don't have to acknowledge publicly, or and it doesn't have to be. It's not like I'm in a relationship to tell people I'm in a relationship. This is kind of a side tangent. This isn't actually that related to my original point. But basically, it's just like a private thing that I don't feel like talking about, and um, I appreciate that you're interested, but... It's just something that I'd like to keep separate. I think the, it's just not it's just not important for my career, and uh, I understand that you guys want to know, but I'm just not gonna generally share that kind of stuff. At least active. I'll talk about like situations involving ex girlfriends, like something I'm gonna cover later in the questions, but, um, but for now, I I don't really like uh, talking about that subject, or I plan to keep it separate. All right, uh, I like this question because it related to me a lot. I have a massive problem with tunnel vision, getting focused on farming, trying to figure out what to do next, and I forget map awareness and almost everything else. You just talked about me. Uh, how could I fix that other than just sticking it, sticking it posted on my monitor? I know people have talked about tricks like this before. Like, for example, one time I read that somebody said, oh, uh, just get it into your head that every time you get a last hit, you look at the map. I thought, that's a pretty cool idea, but that I never did it. Um, so I can't really give you advice on whether or not that's a working or not, because I don't do it myself. I have problem with tunnel vision, and I definitely forget map awareness. There'll be times where I die, and the people in comments will be like, oh my god, that guy was in wards, you're an idiot, like, you didn't look. And I didn't look, and it's totally true, but I think you just have to look at it as a fault as you as a Dota player. Like, I basically look at myself and I say, I can play lots of different roles and I'm good at playing this hero and whatever. My faults are, I suck at map awareness. So, but luckily, one thing that you can do as a team is cover each other's map awareness. So you can say, you can ping somebody that you see on the map. Make sure you just communicate. Like, a big problem with all Dota players, or at least most Dota players, is they don't communicate properly. They just assume that everybody knows what's going on. They'll say, like, wow, I can't believe you didn't back there. Or, like, they'll say back and they'll leave like a second before they say back and then their teammate will, teammates will get initiated and they're like, why didn't you back there? It was so obvious. Like, well, if you had communicated that like five seconds earlier that you felt hesitant, you thought we should maybe back up. I mean, not everybody's gonna have the same understanding of the game. Maybe they won't see stuff. Maybe they won't see somebody's items. Maybe they won't see that somebody has a double damage. If you just communicate that stuff, everybody knows more information is able to react accordingly. So. I'm not saying that you shouldn't watch your map, and obviously you should work on this, but if it's just literally a problem that you have as a player similar to me, then you should just simply pray to God your teammates to help you out, or get better at it. Either one is an option. Try to keep wards on the map. I found that that really helped me with map vision, was when there started being wards on the map. That way, looking at the map actually did something that was helpful to be like, oh, I can see the top rune, or I can see the bottom rune. I can just glance at the map, and now there's actually information to get from it. It's like, if you're playing StarCraft 2 and you don't scout, there's no reason to look at the map, because there's nothing to see. Like, you don't have vision to see. So, that helps as well. Make sure you have wards up, uh, make sure your teammates are communicating at a high level, or at least just communicating. That helps a lot. 
and uh, that should get your map awareness a little better. And then a lot of experience as well. Like there's times now where we'll be farming a lane and be like, as a carry, and I'll be like, I'm getting ganked, and then I'll get ganked. That happened just the other day. And just playing a lot will also give you that information as well. So, all right, this question breaks a page, so it's gonna suck for a bit. Can you see this? Nope. All right, uh, how do I tell a friend to stop building shit? He doesn't listen to reason, his personal skill level is fine, but he builds the exact same items in the exact same order in every game, every fucking game. For example, for Nature's Prophet, he builds it this, he builds this in order. Every time, Ring of Aqua, Dagon level one, Boots of Travel, Agon of Scepter, Desolator. The game really drags on. There was more of this question, but I just left it there because I felt that got the point across. The problem is that people are stubborn. I'm stubborn. I'm sure you may be stubborn about stuff. People are stubborn about stuff. They don't like to change what they think is beautiful, and his build sucks. And obviously people are communicating that to him, but he doesn't want to listen. The problem is that his build sucks. Basilius is fine. Aqua is a no-go for Nature's Prophet. Dagon level 1 can be made to work. Boots of Travel is terrible. He has a global TP every 20 seconds. It's an absolute waste. Aghanim Scepter, after all of that stuff, is also kind of weird, because all it's going to do is push all of the lanes and uh, increase his farm, which is okay. And then he follows it up with another damage item, which is a Desolator, which is already a pretty eh item on Nature's Prophet. There's better options. Sheepstick almost always is better. Gives you 35 damage instead of 60. Doesn't do the Midas Armor, but the Hex alone is by far going to be better than the Desolator. Desolator is cheap, of course, but he doesn't have attack speed like you mentioned later in the post, which I didn't list here, but yeah. Um... There's not really a good way to tell him that it's bad. It's basically going to take him to get better at the game and understand why his item choices are bad and just lose some games and be able to look honestly at his item build and say, well, if you experiment, experimenting really teaches you the most. If you could say, like, wow, I had a treads this game and I did really well, and you do it enough games, and then maybe you'll say, like, wow, on average, I generally do a little bit better. I would have been able to make that play at the 15-minute mark if I had treads instead of boots of travel, if I had treads and a medallion with the Dagon. Like, that would have been pretty good. Go for it. If he just tries different item builds more often, he's going to kind of figure out what works correctly and what doesn't. So he probably is basically looking at every game and playing the same freaking item build every game, and then he just blames other stuff instead of looking at his item build. Like, I would say try to get him to play different item builds on different on the same heroes. It's a really good way to learn a lot of stuff about the game and adjust things. It's the one thing about Dota that by far reminds me the most about StarCraft 2. Because people always talk about build adjustments in StarCraft, and I don't play StarCraft at a very high level, so I would basically look at Dota 2, and I would talk about an item build, and I would maybe swap an item out, and maybe feel like I need more mana on this hero, or maybe my damage wasn't good enough, or maybe my survivability could have been better, because I ended up getting killed too much in the mid-game when I already had an advantage. Stuff like that. And then, as, as you look at that stuff, you can then adjust your item builds, and end up playing better, and on average, winning more games. All that stuff is very important. Item builds, very huge. Alright, uh, you explained how supportive your parents are, okay, this is on screen, how supportive your parents' family has been, which is awesome, do you have a significant other now or in the past that you've had to explain your lifestyle to, especially now that it's something you do professionally, doesn't make dating difficult, any tips for those, uh, for those of us hopelessly addicted to Dota? The reason I wanted to answer this question, I didn't mean to make like a double standard, by the way, about talking about, I don't want to talk about relationships, and then I'm going to talk about an ex-girlfriend, in, in particular, that uh, this applies to, but I just want to give you guys advice, um, I'm always... I love giving people advice, this is kind of like why I love making Dota videos and talking about my opinion about stuff or my, the way I see things, because I want to help you guys. So I, in terms of a video like this, I think this is appropriate to talk about. Um, in the past, I have had pretty much a lot of girlfriends, not saying that I had a lot of girlfriends, I mean, a, most of the girlfriends that I dated were anti-video game, or me, at least they were kind of like, eh... Like, that's, I feel like on average, that's how most women um, perceive it. I mean, there are awesome women at times that play video games or think that it's cool or like to spend time with you that way, but on average, it's generally a point of contention for me or has been in the past. Um, it's kind of like this. If they despise the fact that you like playing video games, you probably should not date them. It's pretty much that fact. Um, I've... I've had some other problems occur where they maybe think that I like video games more than them, which is pretty much never true. It's just like a way that I like spending my free time. But that's not necessarily them hating on video games. It's more them assuming that or upset with other faults with the relationship. Like, if you don't spend enough time with them and then you go and play Dota with your friends for six hours some random day, they're going to say, he, not only does he not spend enough time with me, but now he's playing six hours of Dota. He doesn't care about me. So it's like, it's an ulterior motive, it's, or it's like an underlying problem. It's not that they necessarily hate that you play video games a lot, it's usually, from my perspective, what I've seen, they wish that you spent more time with them. So it's shit like that. So try not to necessarily look at it as, 
they hate you playing video games, look at it as there's needs that you're not uh, fulfilling that they wish you did. That's probably it. And then usually when that happens, that's why whenever people break up, usually they always like make up a bunch of bullshit reasons or like what they think the problem was like, oh God, we, it didn't work out because he just couldn't handle, I don't know. I, I don't have a good example and I don't want to say something stupid. So there's always going to be, whenever people break up, they always have different stories. They'll say like, They'll blame it on one thing, and the other person will blame it on another thing. If you get the story from the two respective parties, it's always like that. So it's kind of interesting. It's usually like underlying problems and trying to figure out why they were feeling insecure. They were insecure because of something else that you did, and that just like starts the ball rolling. So that's probably the best way to say it. And I did date somebody when I first started my channel. I had the idea of doing this, and I was pretty dang sure that it was going to be successful, but she was kind of like... She was supportive, but she didn't really believe me, is what it seemed like. And her parents didn't ask me any questions about it, which I thought, thought was super weird, because their oldest son was really into StarCraft 2, and their younger brother was into video games too, and it was like, it was so weird. Like, it was like she told them that she didn't... I don't know, I don't, I don't want to talk about that much, that's weird. Uh, it's probably weird to let's say that. But it's basically like, at time, yeah, I have had that happen in the past. And it does suck, but whatever. It, it's there's nothing you could do about it basically um and i guess to sum it up just don't date people that aren't okay with what you like to do like if they don't like playing video games you can maybe get them to play video games with you and uh you might be able to work it out i know there's lots of gamers that date people who aren't gamers and uh, it can work out so that's probably the best thing i can say don't try to just latch on to people that don't like idolize all of these girls on the internet that uh play video games and think that they're the only ones out there because there's other people that you can date and i've dated lots of people that didn't play a lot of video games and they didn't know obviously they haven't worked out because i'm not married but <laughs> um it's not a bad thing all right i didn't mean to talk so much about that sorry if you guys are bored but um i figured that was something that i've had experience with and i know that i'm sure there's a lot of younger viewers that haven't dated a lot and uh, since i'm moderately old then i could give you guys my reference point as an experienced video game gamer person who has dated women and girls and stuff. Okay, next question. I should have kept that selected so that people could know what question I was on if they were skipping through, but I fail. Okay. Have I considered what I plan on doing when and if Dota dies down, becomes less popular, lose interest, etc.? Would I plan on moving to a new esport or going back to work in the field of your college major? I would preferably never have to work a normal job for the rest of my life. That would be cool. I like sleeping in. I like doing stuff when I feel like doing stuff. That's the main thing. Everybody does, but usually you have to make trades and not always able to do that. Um, I do know that it's some that someday Dota will die down and maybe it won't be as profitable or maybe it won't be profitable enough or maybe I'll be able to switch jobs or find a career in some other area. Um, I don't really think about that point that much because I think it's going to be probably four to five years down the line. Pro All right, I would say for sure three to five years down the line. Three to seven. Yes, three to seven. That's that's crazy to think. But I just don't think, I don't plan ahead that far. I usually kind of just wing things as they go, if you've noticed that before from uh, my video uploading schedule and stuff. Um, I know that someday it's going to become less popular. I may lose interest. It might die down. Um, I don't necessarily think I'll lose interest. I've already played this game for like four years on now, so I don't really expect, like, it's like if I can make it four years, I think I can rock this for a long time. But... Um, there's just a balance. I, I'm gonna balance things out. Um, I might switch games. Either way, I'm still gonna have a YouTube channel, so I could rebrand in five years if stuff changes and I feel like playing Diablo 4 or something like that, but, um, as of right now, I have no, no plans at all to switch for the next couple years. I'm, I'm feeling at times slightly burned out, but it's just like, uh, just a balance of stuff. I just need to balance my free time more so that I can balance things that I like to do with still working and then uh, find a perfect balance between growing my channel and having free time. And once I find that perfect balance, I think that's when I'm going to be most happy to just upload videos, like five videos a day or five, yeah, right, five videos a week and still have enough free time and be able to cast tournaments and do everything that I want to do. So finding that balance is very hard when you run your own business. And uh, that's probably the main thing that causes burnout is overworking or stuff like that, or just uh, having too many responsibilities. It's very important to keep your stress low. I've always had a very low stress life, so it's been weird the last year and a half. So. Alright, um, I don't know. remember if this was the same question. Uh, would I prefer to join the pro scene as a player rather than a commentator? No. Um, I would love to compete on an amateur level, but I don't think... How loud is that? That's moderately loud. Sorry, I've, I've had the windows open the whole time, so I'm sure you guys heard background noise, but... 
Being a pro player is very, very inconsistent. Being a caster or a commentator or a content maker is far more reliable. It's not even close. Like, there's there's very few people in the esports scene that can make money um, of them. It's usually the top players in the scene, whatever it is, like Navi, for example. They win tournaments semi-regularly, and they get pretty good money from it. Um, so major, major competitors, the top teams, like the top few teams, I'm saying few when I mean few, the top few teams are players. Uh, casters, commentators, streamers, content makers, and then occasionally like a tournament. Like MLG hires a lot of people, but those are all, you know, that's very limited amounts of jobs considering how like how big how big the scene is, how many people are interested in it. So, being a player is not reliable money at all. Therefore, I would probably never want to do it for the money alone. In terms of passion for just wanting to be the best, I think it's unrealistic to expect that I could be the best, so I pretty much just say, I'm probably never going to be that good, therefore I'm not going to put my heart and soul into it, and therefore, no, I won't do it. But I would love to play in amateur tournaments and like actually form a team of people that I respect that are at my skill level and try to get good, try to get really good. But I would never do it with the intention of either being the best or trying to make money out of it, because either one of those is extremely hard to accomplish. And it's kind of scary to set yourself up for something that you honestly don't think you can do. That's very important. Make sure that you set realistic goals. Otherwise, you're just going to get crushed in however long it takes for you to hit the wall. So something that I was very careful of when I thought of doing this. I was like, I actually think this is attainable. And that's why I did it. So very important to do that. And I guess that's it. I have no more questions here. So I think I've covered pretty much everything. Um, I didn't finish out the rest of the thread. I still have a couple more pages to read. If you guys have questions to add, I haven't... Uh, all the comments I covered were up until like July 26th, I think. So that was the last time that I made a video. Uh, a Q&A video, or at least when I posted the thread. So make sure that you guys go add some questions there if you want questions for me to answer. If you guys want me to elaborate on any of the questions that I talked about or the answers that I gave, um, feel free to write in comments and I'll be sure to respond to stuff. Um, let me know if you want to be more personal questions or more Dota questions. I kind of like doing this balance thing because I always want to give you guys advice for experience I've had in the past because I know, um, I'm sure that there's going to be some people that help. So I think that's it. Um, I'm going to try to stream today. I think it's about 2 p.m. Uh, maybe in like two hours or something like that. Maybe in an hour. I'll see what's going on. But uh, thanks for watching, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks for all the questions. Go to the forums. Go check them out. PurgeGamers.com slash forums. International is coming up soon. What is the date? Oh, yeah. There's one more question I have to answer. The 14th. Some guy, the guy who tweeted me, I told him that I was going to answer his questions. And I have Twitter open. And now I just have to find it. Um, there we go. Last question. Uh, do you find two bracers or talismans or wraith bands, etc., effective at all, cost and or stats? And if so, which yours specifically? Yes, they are very cost efficient. They cost fairly little gold. They have very very easy build up, and uh, they give you the best cost efficient, uh, the best benefit that you can for that little gold. The downside is when you go from having 500 gold to having 1500 gold or 2000 gold. All of a sudden, I mean, if you have 500 gold and you don't plan to, and you want to be as strong as possible right then, yeah, buy a bracer you're going to have the best HP that you can get and the best overall stats that you can get for that level or for that gold amount. If you have 2,000 gold, buying a bracer isn't worth it anymore. You could have a vitality booster, which gives you like two bracers and you could still have 900 gold on top of that to build like an urn or something. And all of a sudden you have like way better viability than having like two bracers and a thousand gold. Two bracers and a thousand gold is three item slots. So yeah, bracers and null talismans and wraith bands are good if you're behind basically. They're very cheap, they give you pretty good cost-benefit analysis, but their payoff is not long-term. It's essentially a short period of payoff, which will eventually become obsolete. And uh, examples of that not being obsolete is Bracers, building into Drum of Endurance. That's a great way to build from an early game item that might pay off in the short term to a better late game item. Uh, a lot of Queen of Pains like getting Null Talismans just because it's a very good early payoff and she's a strong early game hero and oftentimes has a mana problem early, so it can be good for that. Occasionally you see Storm Spirits do that. Uh, generally, Wraith Bands are not really that worth purchasing more than one unless you get an Aquila. Just buy like one Wraith Band usually and make an Aquila as good. But as a whole, you shouldn't be buying two of those. As a whole. Try to just get one. Unless you're behind or if you're playing a support hero and you're kind of uh, poor. If you're poor, buy lots of Bracers just to get your HP up. You can do stuff like that. And I think that answers all the questions. That's it. So I can close the video. Thanks for watching, guys. Comments, everything that I told you to do. Subscribe if you like the video content. Thanks for watching, and I'll make sure to bring you guys some more videos soon. I'll see you later. Bye. Closing.